type of works there as um, well? Not intentionally. Um, I had a, <clears throat> a really good friend uh, at uh, university <clears throat> who died very suddenly in a uh, automobile accident. Uh, we were very close. And um, it was a big shock to everybody. And years and years later, when we were doing all this stuff at the lab, and like there was a uh, maybe at the Quest Bookshop or something, there was a, a author or whatever discussing, you know, how to contact people that had died. So that night, I you know just sort of in the zone, uh, you know, slept for a while, woke up, and I started thinking about Bruce. It felt like <clears throat> uh, there was an energy body that came halfway into me, and immediately I recognized the the personality that I knew as Bruce, and I, you know, I just somehow I knew that was him, and I could feel this sort of energy interaction, and I tried, you know, in my mind talking to him, uh, you know, you died several years ago in this accident and maybe not realize where you are and you got to kind of step back and, um, you know, realize what's going on and move on with your life and don't be, you know, stuck and attached here and, and sort of drift it off and it was very emotional uh, and I felt a lot better after that and I had a couple other similar kinds of things with friends and so there was some sort of interaction there. That I, was I think that might be an example. Uh, you were that was as much uh, a help to you as it was. To well, yeah, Chris. actually, yeah, it was a it was a, a release kind of thing for me. Didn't have a lot of practice with that. However, I did hold on for dear life in the back of that motorcycle because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready to let go yet of this life. I, I've heard you two are pretty anxious to get to Whistlefield. Well, I mean, we had, we had <laughs> the, the, inter the interstate that went 80% of the way, so <laughs> basically we just got on the interstate and, you know, warp speed. And, and, uh, you know, when you're 20-something year, years old and you have a big four-cylinder motorcycle, it doesn't actually get fun until you pass 80. So, in uh, yeah, in, sec in second gear, right? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we we went out to Whistlefield. We got there in about uh, you know 40 minutes, half an hour or so. Uh, it, uh, it was mostly interstate, so. and the interstate was mostly empty. It wasn't a busy interstate. It was a fairly new interstate. It had just been built. It didn't have a lot of traffic on it like it would today. Well, I mean, I'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. Um, <laughs> we probably yeah. will, or maybe we did. Um, yes. Well, it was terrific. Yeah, I just say, um, you know, follow your instincts, um, try to live in the present, and try to be aware of your physical, your emotional, your psychological environment, and that of your friends and family and, and strangers, and kind of see what happens. And uh, if something strange happens, you know, Pay attention to it, but don't necessarily believe it. And uh, try it again. Open-minded skepticism. Yeah, that's the way to travel. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, kind of an advice to people, you know, who kind of are interested in this path, is don't focus on the phenomenon. Don't focus on going out of body. Don't focus on uh, you know paranormal things. Focus on growing up. That's really the key thing. As you grow up and, and your reality gets bigger and your decision space gets bigger, these other things become available to you. They become easy to do. It's getting the, the cart in front of the horse if you want to start with the phenomena, you see, instead of starting growing up. So grow up, become love, you know, work in that direction, and then the larger reality, you know, your intuition, 
all that sort of thing will just start to grow and happen all by itself. And like Dennis says, you just pay attention to it. Always stay skeptical and open-minded and pay attention to those things. But many people go the other way around. What they want to do first is to have these cool experiences. They want to go out of body and they want to see things and go places and they want to prove it. And that's kind of backwards. It's better off to spend your energy on trying to grow up, um, you know, approach every decision you make, you make thousands of decisions in a day, every decision, every interaction with caring, with love, you know, about others rather than about self. And if you practice that, you'll find these other things. If you have an interest in them, that's good. But you'll find they just happen. You don't really have to work so hard for them. The other way is very frustrating. Trying to, you're trying to get someplace that you're not quite ready to get to yet. Dennis and I, of course it wasn't necessarily called the Monroe Institute at that time, and it certainly wasn't in the same property that they are now. So all of that kind of occurred because of Bob and Dennis and I and the things that we all brought to it together. You know, that's how, that's, that's where the Monroe Institute got birthed from. Uh, came out of that little trailer lab, you know, out of Whistlefield was its, was its origins. <clears throat> there weren't very many people who really uh, remember any of that. Almost everybody there came long after that. Mm -hmm. Most of them have never been to Whistlefield Farm. You know, Bob left that and got this new land probably about 1980, you know, 1, 82, somewhere yeah, in the late 70s. You know, 79? Better? Late, late 70s when he bought it, but it was years before they did. Yeah, before they did anything with it. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so that didn't actually start to take place with buildings and that kind of stuff the until the 80s. So all of that was after kind of our time. So no, when I went there and I, and I, I told them the history, basically, you know, where did Hemisync come from? You know, where did Monroe Institute come from? What were the early days that created this, this thing? And uh, mostly it was all brand new and a surprise to most of those people because they just didn't know. So it, it's sort of a lost history. Maybe it'll be less lost now because I just told a whole bunch of them about it and <coughs> it's on videotape, so a lot more will see it. But, um, yeah, the only one <coughs> that shared a lot of that was Bob's, uh, Bob's stepdaughter, Nancy Lee. You know, so she remembers a lot of that and, and helped recollect some of the memories when, when Tom was working on his book. We sort of corresponded years ago and tried to get a lot of the details back together. Well, you know, there was one old timer that was at the TMI when I was there a few, what was it, about three weeks ago. And that was uh, Joseph Chilton Pierce. Right. He wrote the uh, Cracking the Cosmic Egg and probably 20 other books yeah. by now. Yeah. And he was one of the participants in one of those early seminars that we did at the uh, Tuckahoe. Right. So, uh, matter of fact, he got up afterwards and uh, said, I was at the Tuckahoe. He's like 80, you know, 88, 89 years old. And he uh, gave a little talk there yeah. and uh, said, I was at the Tuckahoe. I remember that. <coughs> so there are a few around still that kind of remember the times that we were there, but not too many. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> uh, there was a young, young guy named John Palmer who was a grad student at UVA working for Bob Van de Castle. And he's still around. He's now president of the American Parapsychological Society, something or other. He's written, you know, hundreds of papers on this stuff. He's still around. I remember that. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we're running out of time, and they're going to kick us out of the swimming pool, so. <laughs> Over and out.